Hi everybody. We are going to be having a really interesting conversation today. Today, it's going to be with Atara Ice, who is the managing director, the director, I should say, of the Nishmat Yoetzot um, program in the United States. And she, I mean, she wears many, many hats, but the discussion here today is going to be delving into many different areas of Mikva and how it relates to all of you in the fertility world and how we can make it better. That's what this space is going to be about and that's what this conversation is going to be about. Um, we've spent, I'm just gonna grab her and wait for her to come on. Um, we've spent a lot of time over the last couple of weeks talking about different aspects of mikvah that are difficult you know, in many people's lives and specifically in the fertility space, when you're struggling to have a child, when you're, you know, when you've, God forbid, lost a baby, it is very, very hard to go to a space that reminds you every time you're there that you are not pregnant. And when you are there and, and having to inspect your body, this body that has failed you, this body that has, you know, let you down in so many different ways and then having to inspect it and check it and maybe having other people check it, which is a whole other discussion which we've started to go into, it, it just, it brings up so many different triggers. So I'm really excited that we're gonna be talking to Atara here today. Atara, let me grab her. Hold on a second, guys. Um, so, you know, we've been talking a little bit about the attendant, about doing, here she is, um, doing attendant training. We've been talking about, you know, should the attendant be, could the attendant be pregnant or not pregnant? Should there be babies in the mikvah? Like there are a, a, a million places to start, but where I want to start, Atara, is having you introduce yourself. Please, please, please say hello. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me well? Yes, you're good. Okay. Amy, thank you so much for inviting me on. I'm Atara. It's really nice to be here with your community that you're building, um, the remarkable community. Um, I, when I read through the posts that you share and read through the comments, it's just, it's so amazing, the level of chizuk that everybody's giving each other. It really is remarkable that this, that this community exists. So thank you for inviting me to speak to your community. Um, Anyway, uh, I'm Atara. I, uh, I'm trained as a Yoetzot Halacha um, through Nishmat. That is the organization that trains Yoetzot Halacha. I, I've been a Yoetzot Halacha for like 15 years. I lived in Lower Merion, Pennsylvania after I studied in the program in Israel. Um, then my family made Aliyah six years later. So we lived in Efrat. But I still feel incredibly passionate about making sure that Every single woman has the ability to have a dignified conversation about her body um, and keeping really all of the different laws that relate to women's reproductive health. And specifically, um, a few years ago, I trained with a group of about 20 veteran Yoaso Halacha in Israel um, to be a fertility counselor, right? We, we did our regular training as a Yoas that I did that like feels like a lifetime ago. And then a few years ago, we did a deep dive into fertility because, you know, the issues are so, I mean, everything's changing all the time. And to be able to go in depth and really know how to support as many situations as possible, as many couples as possible, women as possible. Um, it was an amazing training. And our Yoatzot Halakha fertility counselors are available to women around the world, and we're in the process of starting that program here in America. Um, so fertility is near and dear to my heart, um, being able to support women in particular who are going through fertility challenges. And uh, that's why I'm very, very grateful to join you in this incredibly important conversation. I, I, so let's, I mean, let's just jump right into it. I mean, you and I, 
we talk pretty frequently. We, we've had, you know, lots of conversations. I ask you, you know, can you help me with resources here? Can you help me with resources there? What do you think about this topic? What do you think about that topic? And, you know, two weeks ago, when we started talking about mikvah, it, it was in the context of people's difficult experiences, the things that they hate about mikvah, the things that they wish could be different, why it brings up so so many different feelings in them. And we're only talking, like this community only talks about fertility. That's what we talk about. There are, there are, there are a million other reasons why mikvah can be difficult for other subsets of the population. And we're not going to touch that today because that's not our community. But some of the things that were brought up then and continue, these themes continue to come up, you know, even through this week, are my body has failed me and i i in that i'm not getting pregnant and everyone around me is getting pregnant and so i go to the mikvah every single month sometimes for years and years and years and that going that remind that actual physical, you know, the checking and the, the going and the dipping and the seeing the attendant and so on. Every piece of it is just another reminder that I'm still not pregnant. Right? right. And then there is the other aspect of someone who, God forbid, lost a baby. And you know, when you're pregnant, we don't go to the mikvah, generally speaking, because hopefully it's a, it's a pregnancy where you're not bleeding and therefore don't need to go. So being in the mikvah after a loss is just this like overwhelming sense of like, I'm just not supposed to be here. Like I was pregnant and I was hoping that that pregnancy was going to continue. And so we started having a discussion about what can we do to make things better? So I'm just going to really open the floor to you and, and say like, what can we do? What can we do to make this a little easier? So first of all, I, I think there's a lot of practical, there's a lot of practical work to be done. There's a lot of sensitivity training to be done, which thank God is, is happening more and more. There are a lot of different organizations that are really working to sensitize uh, mikvah attendance and make sure they understand things to say, things not to say. The list of what not to say is like far longer than the th list of things to say. Um, I, I mean, I think the discussion of bringing babies there is, is that I was reading, and you know, it's like one of the women who wrote like after a stillbirth that she then had to go to the mikvah and the mikvah attendant had her baby. Now we need to have down the kasrut, right? Like we need to have benefit of the doubt that something happened. There was a last minute mistake. Some, you know, a last minute mitzvah that needed to happen, some, something. But at the same time, like, these are things that we should try our very best to avoid. So there's a lot of practical, but I, I just want to actually talk, like, theologically for a minute, if that's okay. Um, Please. And I think that um, I, I was, I've been thinking about two different things. First of all, um, our tradition, you know, because it's, it's a tradition that, thank God, been around for a very long time, um, and at a time uh, where, it, you know, it was originally written at a time where really uh, stillbirth was far more common, right? Pregnancy loss was far more common. Um, women didn't get regular periods at the same time, and they didn't necessarily go to the mikvah monthly, um, but it was a far more common thing. And the, the halakha itself um, refers, sometimes refers to the, the womb as um, as a grave, which is really harsh and stark and raw, but sometimes it refers to it, which is this understanding, sometimes this, this does not go the way we want it to go. Um, and so every time I read it, when I see the, that term used, I'm like, oh, like punch in the gut. And at the same time, thank you for acknowledging that. Thank you for acknowledging that not every pregnancy ends in, in what we want and not every month ends in what we want. So that's point number one. And point number two that I wanted to bring up is I think part of um, the pain might come from the fact that many women, when we get married, we're taught, right, why do we go to the mix every month? We go to the mix every month because there was a potential for life 
and it didn't happen. And that's very, very painful, right? It's painful. Well, it's painful if somebody says, well, I'm not, it's also confusing, right? There are women who say like, but I wasn't trying to get pregnant, right? Sometimes they're not, right? So, so why, so then I, do I need to use the mixer? There was no potential for life. I'm blocking ovulation, right? Um, and, and, and then it's painful for those who are like, yeah, <laughs> you needed to remind me, <laughs> like, I, I know there was, uh, you know, potential for life and, but, or, or there wasn't because my ovulation is not doing what it's supposed to do. So there wasn't potential. So it can feel very insulting um, and very triggering. Um, one piece that I'd like to share is that Rav Yehuda Herzl Henkin, who was the, the founding postdoc of Nishmat, his wife, Hannah Henkin, Rabbi Hannah Henkin founded Nishmat. Actually, his first yard site is coming up this coming Monday. Um, he has, he has a remarkable reframe of what mikvah, what, what the whole concept of tuma is about. He says, that it, okay, maybe sometimes it's about the potential for life, but it's actually any time we are faced with our finitude, any time we're faced with the fact that as opposed to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God, who is infinite, he always was, he is, he will be, we are human. And this is raw and this is this and and any time we're using mitzvah and 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 if we could talk about it and see how it applies in each time, but like it has to do with realizing I'm not I wasn't here forever and I'm not here forever. Which again I don't think that's comforting. I don't know that's comforting, but I think it's just very honest. Maybe there was no potential this month, or maybe there was and it it didn't happen. Um, but no matter what, it's it's not halakha being you know super toxic positivity. It's halakha being like very honest with the complications of fertility. Now, again, I don't know that that's going to give chizuk in any kind of way, but I think, it, I think it's a much more honest reflection of what things are about. So that's like the theological, the philosophical. Um, of, in terms of, do you want, you want to talk like, about so, so, Yeah. So, 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 yeah, so, so let me, let's just like go into that a little bit further just for a second. So, like so, just to make sure I'm understanding what 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 you what what he's trying to say. So what he's saying is that it's not that like we we like th this like kindergarten concept of like you know each each month is is the essence like going to the mechva means that you know life does now not exist like that that sort of kindergarten childish con con childish concept should be reframed as past, present, and future, that this is part of life's continuum, and that maybe there was, maybe there wasn't, but that sort of take it in a whole as opposed to the piece you are now. Is, is that, am I, did, I, did I hear that correct? I, I actually, I think that's a really interesting, like, co corollary to what I was saying. Like, recognize yourself in continuum, recognize yourself in, you know, maybe, maybe try to zoom out from this particular month. Um, but I, again, I think the main part of it is, it's not like, and this is supposed to feel awesome. <laughs> it, 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 it might be, and, and some months it does, but it's like, it's almost like I'm, I know this is hard. It's like, it's like a, a hug, right? Like, I know this is really hard um, and may not feel great right now. And and that's because, yeah, you are really facing, we, there's, there's, this, is, this is a real facing of like, oh my goodness, but I want to bring the next generation into this world. And I'm trying so hard to do this mitzvah. And why is Hashem not making this mitzvah more easy for me? Like, why is this such right. a source of pain? Um, so I, I'm just, I'm validating. I just, I think it's tough. And, I'm, and I, I, I think that, but I think that the halacha itself is not saying like, and this is amazing. It's saying, this is hard. Um, I don't know that that makes it easier to, to, to go down those steps. It doesn't make it easier to inspect one's body, right? To, right, you're looking, and, and Amy, you reached out to me two weeks ago. And we were talking about that. You were like, for some women, it's like, I'm now inspecting this body before I go into the mikvah that has failed me. And, and it's, um, you know, one thing that, that we had talked about was like, well, are there ways, like, I would love to reach out to a therapist together and talk about, like, what are mantras that we can give women while they're preparing for mikvah, while their body has, has failed them, has not done what they have asked it to do? Um, 
And like, what can they do to like, give their body self love? It, it, honestly, right? To at the same time, be able to say like, hello, body part that failed me, right? Like, right. yes, I'm really not so pleased with you right now. Um, and at the same time, you know, what are ways in which we can then move toward a mantra, a statement, uh, a, a way of, of embracing that body part of, of, you know, asking Hashem to, to heal you. Um, that's, that's something. Now, again, that's more about what we as individuals can do. I feel like, should we first go to what communities need to do or should do or recommendations? I, I, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, let, let's, let's stay here for a minute because, because we're, okay. we're already here. I, we're here. We want to we <laughs> yeah. do both in this talk. I, yeah. I think that there, there is like speaking more about the individual, right? That there is the, the this idea that like, and, and like bringing back also like, you know, the, what, what Halacha says about this, right? That there is okay, this, yeah. this idea and, and many people learn this about mikvah and they have mikvah attendants say this to them. Like, it's supposed to be beautiful. It's supposed to be a great experience. This is supposed to be your time. This is supposed to be like self care for you. Like, and, and, and people feel bad about the fact, whether it's because their body has failed or, you know, they're not getting pregnant or they just like, whatever the reason is fertility wise, again, we're sticking to the fertility space, but that yeah. they're not connecting to this, like, it's supposed to be beautiful. And then therefore, like, does it mean I'm not like, like the experience is invalidated because I'm not thinking it's beautiful. And, and then also like, should I, should I feel guilty about all of that? How can I reframe it for myself? Like so many of these pieces like are, are just so hard for people. And, and I'm sort of going to layer on top of it, the like, but they're still going right. There is a subset of women who will say, I'm done with this. I can't do it anymore. It's too hard. So I, I'm putting that aside. I, I'm right. talking about the women who are saying, this is bad. This is awful. It's not beautiful. I don't relate it. My, my body has failed. I'm doing this month after month. I'm not getting pregnant, but I'm still here because I feel it's important in my role as a Jewish woman because I believe in halacha, whatever the reasons are, you do it but it feels yuck. Right. So um, what I love about the name of your Instagram handle is I was supposed to have a baby, right? Because that is the raw root of how women are feeling. And I was supposed to, you know, it was supposed to be beautiful. Um, I, I don't know. With that, I think like, again, I don't think that mikvah attendance and, and the more we can get the word out, the better. I don't think they should be saying anything. <laughs> um, I don't think that at that visit to the mikvah, the only thing that woman should be saying is, oh, please, please go to room number three. Do you need anything? Do, <laughs> do you need some slippers? Is, you know, please put the towel in the following and place kosher. on your way out. <laughs> and kosher. <laughs> and maybe would you like a few mi extra minutes by yourself? Kadavid, right? Maybe. <laughs> um, right. And if, if we could just stick to those rules, I think we'd be in a better position, right? right. I, I, um, but, but that being said, we're, we bring so much into the mikvah, right? We're not, it's not just what the mikvah attendant says. It's what did the college teacher say? It's what did the refresher course say? It's what did her friends say? I love mikvah, right? Like what, <laughs> it's not just that. And I think, you know, it's, I, one of the one of the themes that was coming up in all of your posts, which was so I've heard it from women often, right? Like when you're going through infertility, everything is triggering. A person walking across the street could be triggering, right? Like anything could be triggering because you're in such pain. I mean, you know, like you're you're in right. They've done studies that like you're in more you're in more pain than people who are going through chronic or terminal illness. Like we're, we're not talking about simple things. We're talking about a very serious thing. So anything could be triggering. That being said, does that mean that we shouldn't ban babies from the mikvah? We should ban babies from the mikvah, okay? Um, does that mean, and we should have, we should still have some 
down the cops, but we should. But like, um, totally, you know, totally. I, can, can we, I mean, I'm going all over the place, but, but like, can we talk about no, the, no, no, you're good, you're good. The, the, um, the pregnant micro attendants? Because also like, I mean, it's not like I have anything to add. I thought that the post you shared, it was like all this, right? Like from, can, can we give the option, right? But again, it doesn't help. If you know the name of the micro attendant, but you don't know she's pregnant, then it doesn't help to Correct. stop that, right? Correct. Um, could, you know, but like, at the same time, you know, if someone said like, yeah, but what if someone looks pregnant, but they're not pregnant? We know that happens too. And so she, she, she can't be a mix attendant, right? So it's a, it's a lot. I think even without that, it's triggering, but at the same time, right? So there's, I, but again, on that one, I'm going to weigh in on like babies are different than, than, you know, a pregnant mix attendant where also in small towns, you just may not have options. So. Correct. Oh. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So, okay, so I, I look. You know, this discussion is not meant for us to like, you know, come come up with answers. It's more meant for you know us to be like on high, having these discussions and sort of talking about them from a place like you're you're the authority here. You're the one who is sitting literally every day with you know doing trainings and also sitting with women who are coming to you with these issues. And you know, how, how do we? And, and, and trying to figure out way, ways to make it easier. So and now I'm going to sort of reframe and go back to the communal aspect, right? The, the piece that we were talking about was about how COVID made things a lot easier for many people in regard to checking, in regard to speaking, in regard to like seeing other people, in regard to so many of the different triggers that one has in uh, surrounding mikvah um and what we were what we were talking about is whether there is room in halacha from your perspective to have those kinds of procedures more permeate regular time non-pandemic time in, in all mikvahs and i'm like I, I mean that's like a crazy thing because nobody can mandate what to do in all mikvahs because every community is very different but that could like, could pandemic halacha be used for other situations as well? So what, what are your right. thoughts? Okay. This, this I find so fascinating because if you look at the halacha, um, the halacha states that the, the most important thing that a woman must do in order to prepare for the mikvah is what we call iyun, looking at the body. That's the biblical responsibility that a woman has to make sure she looks all over her body to make sure that, that there's no barrier to immersion. There's no casita. There's nothing that, you know, is not part of her body that is extra, um, that is still on her body. Um, and, and on the biblical level, she looks at her body, but there's, um, there's no obligation to, to wash the body. Okay. Now still with the looking, hello uterus that failed me this month, right? Hello legs that, what, what, the whole the whole experience, right? Um, so that that doesn't make it don't, that much hard, it's easier. But the the bit the rabbinic responsibility, which obviously as rabbinic Jews we keep this very seriously, is to take away all of um, to do a um, to do a um, to clean, right? Um, but not in but again with the focus not on not on the scrubbing and not on the like focusing too much, but on just cleansing, a general cleansing. Um, and after that, um, the, it, I think what's most important to understand is that it's the woman's responsibility herself to ensure that she's ready for the mix. Okay. Um, which means that no, if, if you open up the Shulchan Aruch, what it says is the need for a mikvah attendant is, in order to do the one thing she can't do, it's in order to make sure that she's entirely under the water. And um, it's hard to know. Like, I don't know. I myself, when I go under, I'm like, was I all the way under? Did I get all my hair underneath? Um, so that's the role of the mikvah attendant. And what we saw in COVID is that the mikvah attendant waited until the woman was in the room, waited until the woman was in the water, didn't come into the room, stood further away, didn't inspect her. Um, and these are things where you, you know, and, and also, as you said, like, there are appointments, 
you don't see anyone else going in, right? You're there by yourself. Nobody knows you're at the mikvah again. Um, so many of these things, like, really um, enable a lot more privacy if someone chooses to have privacy at this time, because um, that's important, too, um, is that that is a choice, right? Um, but so Absolutely. What, um, what's interesting is that there, there, there is one opinion that says, like, oh, well, as an extension of the mikvah attendant's role in making sure all the hair is underneath, she also should help the woman make sure that she has no chatzisa. So I don't want to discredit that opinion because it does exist. There is that opinion. So if you're in a community where the mikvah attendant normally does check you, right? So to understand that there is, it's, it's based on strong halakhic sources, but it's not, I, I wouldn't say that it's the majority opinion. I would say the majority opinion is straight up what's written in the Shulchan Aruch. Her job is to do what you can't do, right? Um, I actually, I just paraphrased that a little, but like, right. And so can we okay. do that? Can we, thank you. Uh, can we stick with that all year round? Right. Please God, this pandemic got to go. Right. Can we stick with those rules? I would love to see that stick around. Right. And, and I think that for women going, right, this is a, a community focused on fertility, but like for all women, I think a lot of women really would would feel that their experience is more dignified. Some women don't care, and that's fine. <laughs> it's great and yep. fine if that doesn't bother somebody, and that's no judgment, like, no problem. But right. if it does, like, yes, these rules are amazing. <laughs> like, they've been so helpful for women. And, um, and, there's, and there's strong halakhic grounding for those aspects, right? Like, we can all go to nail salons again, right? And therefore, the questions of nail polish and mikvah, that's, that's not the same. We can, right? <laughs> You know, we can all get waxed. We can all all those things. But like right. these, there's no reason to not have that say. And you know, I, it's interesting. We've sometimes on our um, Instagram, we've done like polls. Like, does your attendant check you? Does she not? Like, it's really fifty fifty out there, right? There are really a yep. lot of different practices out there. And I think that you know, if women incredibly respectfully went to their mix vote, first of all, people should get involved. You know, people should go and help set those policies. And if they respectfully go and they say, and, and it would be amazing if all women, whether they're facing a fertility challenge or not, let's support each other. Right? We really need to support each other. And if we all say to the mikvahs, in, in however they're organized, like, can we stick with this? Can this remain? Because this is great. Um, I think that would be amazing. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. I, and, and it's so interesting because yeah. what, you know, what was seen as norm, right? That you go in, you get checked, you're waiting with like 12,000 people, you're, you know, on top of each other, you, the mikvah, like, like, she's, she's like, you know, looking at each part of you and in, depend, I mean, I'm speaking only from my own personal experience, you know, sometimes I would go prior to COVID, nobody would check me, nobody would care, nobody would do anything and I would like, just go and do like, and the only thing the person did was make sure my hair was under, right? And there are other times where like, they want to see the bottom of my foot, they want to see my entire back, they want to check my fingernails, too short, too long, too this, Andre, I, I'm like, where, like, it's, it's the, the, you know, the, the wide array of like differences in practices, like always had me like scratching my head thinking like, Am I doing something wrong if I'm going to the mikvah and I'm not getting checked? And so, and the answer this, is, I think, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Right, the answer is that's the beauty of our tradition is that we have different different opinions out there, and we can respect the opinion. Like I, I think there's still ways. Like let's say somebody really is genuinely holding by the idea that a woman should check. Right, that the mikvah attendant's responsibility as an extension of making sure her hair is under the water is also to check. Right, there are better ways to do that. Right, there are ways in which she can do that in more respectful ways. Like asking permission goes so far. Right, like you go to the gynecologist. Is it okay if I now, you know, do this now? Right, right? like giving the autonomy a bit more to the woman going through it. Like, is it okay if I check your nails now? Yes, it's okay. Right. Um, yes. And by the way, hopefully, if she says, I would really appreciate it if you didn't, uh, then she <laughs> then, then she wouldn't. But I mean, also, sometimes, right. like I tell women, 
Like if I ever go to, if, if a woman calls me, she's like, you know, I'm going, I'm going to be at my in-laws place and the mikvah there is, the policy is like the mikvah tenant really looks, but I live in a place where that's not done. Like, what can I do? So one thing I say to them is like, pretend you're going on like a trip. You really are. Like, pretend you're like, you know, doing um, an, um, an anthropological study of like how mikvah is done in another place. Like, make a game out of it in some kind of way so that you can tolerate it. Because yeah, when in Rome, we do as the Romans, like, we, you know, and we don't, but, but at the same time, I think like there's so many, I, I would hope that mikvahs say, okay, this is the base halacha. Let's, let's go with it. I, 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 I've been holding on to it. There, there's a message that I got from someone who I'm planning on posting later, but she said she was in another community a smaller community, and in her own community, the mikvah attendants do not check. And so she wasn't prepared. She didn't know that that was going to be happening. And she, you know, got there and the woman said, okay, you know, I need to check you now. And she's like, oh no. And she's like, no, no, I need to check you now. And she's like, that's not the way they do it where I am. And she said, well, that's our policies here. We, you will not dip unless I check you the woman started hysterically crying, saying, I don't want this, I don't want this, I don't want this, I don't need this, I don't need this, to the point of where the mikvah attendant called the rabbi of the community, saying, I've got this woman crying here, saying she doesn't want to be checked. Isn't it our policy that I have to check her or else she can't dip? And the rabbi told her, you don't have to check her. Let her dip, right? And so, and, and to the point where this woman said, and I'm going to put this up right afterwards, this woman said, you know, this is a place where she has a family member, so they visit them often. And if she has to go to the mikvah at some point while she's there, she actually refuses to go. She's like, I, I just won't go because I've been so traumatized by that experience that I'm just not going to go and I'll go afterwards. Like, I, I cannot deal with that. And that's what we should be trying to avoid. Right. Right. So I think it's a lot about education, starting com conversations in your own community, speaking with the rebellion prophylactically, right? Before these things come up, find out what the shul policy is, uh, the mikvah policy. Speak to the Mara de Atra, speak to the, the postic for the mikvah and say, um, I understand the halacha is, you know, that this is the policy. Um, is there any way on behalf of my sisters, on behalf of myself, that this can be optional? Like, there are conversations we can have, and right. um, and and it would be amazing to get those conversations going. Right. Um, okay. Look, I, I, I uh, we could talk for hours. I, I mean, we could talk for hours about ways to make it better. Ways and like you know, we're we're going to continue talking in the next few days about you know things to say, things not to say, all the different pieces about triggering, and you know, I I'm I'm going to want you know you and and your your colleagues to you know to comment but i mean how would you leave this conversation this community i mean how do you how do you leave people here who are you know these are the people who are committed to doing this mitzvah this mitzvah is happening for them they are doing it and yet it's hard but they're doing it anyway how, what do you leave them with I don't leave them. I stand with them. Yeah. And I That's applaud it. them for sticking with a mitzvah that on a given month can be incredibly painful. I do strongly believe that over the long haul, this mitzvah and the details that we put into it, Hashem gave it to us for a reason. Our rabbis designed it the way they designed it for a reason. And we should feel that we should, we should feel that, but we're, we don't necessarily feel that month to month. We don't necessarily feel that year to year. And those who never feel it, all the, my hats off to them even more because they're doing it simply out of fidelity to halakha, even when it hurts. And that, that to me is, is real, they're heroine. So I don't leave them. I'm standing with each one of you. Hi, Hatara. Thank you. You know, um, one of the messages I, I think you saw, one of the messages that I got when um, I told the community that you were coming on is someone said, 
Atara saved my marriage years ago. She saved my marriage. Pretty amazing. Because of the work that she does. And so on behalf of all of us, I, I just thank you for the work that you do because you are saving communities and saving marriages. And we're just so grateful. Grateful to be working with the community and working for the community and to be the messenger where I can be to bring people shalom bayit and to support people, whatever they're going through. Amen. Amen. Okay, everybody, thank you, Amy. you can reach out. You're, you're welcome. You're welcome. You can reach out to Atara via the Nishmat Yoetso.us um, uh, Instagram page or, you know, through their website. I'm going to tag them all here. But she, it, she is an incredible resource. Your local Yoetso are incredible resources as well. Reach out to all of them. You don't need to, like, you can find her. She's available. But you have people, so <laughs> many of you all over the world have people in your own communities who can help guide you with these halachos and help make it a little bit easier. Reach out to them. We beg you. We beg you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Amy. You're welcome. Good Shabbos. Good Shabbos. Good Shabbos. And, um, we'll talk soon. We'll yeah. talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.